Okay, so um, I think we can start. So um, thank you for joining us. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Alexandra and I'm part of the marketing team here at Graphware. And I would like to welcome you to this Q&A event about the book Graph Powered Machine Learning, written by our very own chief scientist, Dr. Alexandra Negro. Congratulations again. <laughs> As you know, we're very proud of Alessandro and we're very excited about the book. And so we thought it would be nice to give you a chance to ask him any questions you might have about graphs, graph databases, machine learning, machine learning projects, and anything else that comes to mind. So please don't be shy, use the Q&A tool to send in your questions. And I'd like to remind you that the three most interesting questions will be rewarded by a free copy of Graph Powered Machine Learning. So good luck. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Michal Bachmann, our founder and CEO of Graphware, who is going to welcome you once again and share his opinion and excitement about the book. Thank you, Sasha. Hi, everyone. It's uh, good to see you guys. I can see the attendee list, so happy to see some uh, partners, clients, former clients, friends and fans. Welcome to the webinar. I won't uh, take too much of your time. I just wanted to say a few words about this book and how much it means to us and to me personally. So if you have tried to write a book like I have um, and I failed, you know how hard it is. So I'm extremely proud of Alessandro for actually finishing this. It's taking almost three years and it's very timely. The release of the book is very timely because we have been uh, not only preaching, but practicing graph powered machine learning for, I'd say five years, maybe seven, but really the timing of the release of the book is couldn't be better because you can see that it is now when this concept uh, is really taking off. Uh, not only thanks to Neo4j and their graph data science library, but um, thanks to other happenings in the, in the technology space, uh, data scientists, machine learners, data engineers, they are picking up graphs and starting to realize that this, these two concepts are really uh, a natural fit, match made in heaven. Um, so I'm really, really happy, uh, super excited about um, the availability of the book. If you don't have gifts for your grandparents for Christmas, you know, uh, you know where to go and what to give them. Um, I will uh, not take any more of your time and uh, hand over to Alessandro. Alessandro, congratulations again. The stage is yours. Thank you, Michael, and hi, everyone. So, Sasha, are you going to take uh, some of the questions for me? And um, then. Yes, sorry. Um, we can start with a pretty easy one. Who is the book written for? Who do you think would get the most out of reading it? or learn the most? Well, definitely I think that uh, this is a book that uh, every machine learning practitioner or uh, every uh, data scientist uh, should uh, read. Not because uh, this is, a, let's say, uh, it contains uh, techniques that uh, must be used, but uh, because uh, I think that everybody should know all the possibilities um, um, that uh, uh, the, Let's say the field offers in order to get uh, uh, things done and that uh, uh, in that specific area so every um, every reader could find uh, alternative ways uh, graph based of course for uh, doing stuff that uh, they were doing before but maybe in a different way and this is true uh, for recommendations this is true for for detection this is true for natural language processing so all these techniques are very common uh, in um, uh, and that not really graph based related but uh, this book could give them other um, approaches so another point of view to uh, afford uh, these uh, um, these tasks uh, using a different way so maybe that in some cases they will need it in other cases they will not read it need it but reading it they could uh, have more opportunities that uh, uh, you know in these cases uh, it's always uh, a better thing to have when you are uh, you know, in a condition in which uh, you need to deal with the uh, big data, for example, or you need to deal with some uh, flexibility, graph-based approaches can give you, um, you know, what you need in some cases. In other, just you don't need it, but you know that you don't need it. So that's why they should just uh, have a look at it and uh, uh, discover new opportunities. Right. 
Thank you. Um, okay, I wonder did you write the book about this topic? What made you believe that there is a gap in knowledge about this? Uh, Sorry, I missed you for two seconds. Can you repeat it again? Oh, yeah. Uh, where, when did you decide that you would write about graphs and machine learning? Um, how did you spot the gap in knowledge about this? Well, definitely, as uh, Mikael was mentioning before, we are practicing this uh, combination of uh, graphs and machine learning since a while, even uh, before anybody else was uh, even mentioning uh, them as a power couple, a couple actually. So. Um, one of the reasons why I started writing it was because, uh, you know, we were flooded by different type of uh, ideas, uh, some from ourselves, other from our customers, and we, uh, and I, I personally wanted to put uh, all these ideas together in a form that could be useful for myself first, and then for uh, other people, specifically GovAware people at the beginning, and, uh, you know, but this could work for, for everybody outside and so that's why um, I decided to start uh, uh, working on this book that uh, you know um, wanted to put together um, a sort of baseline of understanding around uh, uh, machine learning and, uh, and graph together in a moment in which uh, graphs were mostly uh, used for something else so uh, since at graph where we were already using we were able um, to, to see the future and uh, you know, I knew that uh, it wouldn't have been uh, easy to write, so we started earlier, and uh, we reached um, uh, an end conclusion just in the right moment, uh, because now it's the right moment for for people that are using, for example, graphs since a while to start uh, using uh, um, something more or getting more from from, from the graphs. And uh, you know, this book is coming out in the. Uh, right moment, but we we needed to think a bit uh, ahead, you know, uh, a few years ago, and uh, envision what could have been the, the need in three to four years. Mm -hmm. Okay, our next question is: Is this book uh, good for newbies in graph-powered machine learning space? Well, I hope so. I hope so, in the sense that uh, you know uh, the structure of the book uh, uh, it's trying to to help uh, even. Uh, newly in the uh, in the field um, the first three chapters definitely are uh, easy to read uh, for everybody even for not machine learning experts i would say because they introduce a generic concept and uh, they provide a, a broader understanding of the entire field from scratch so i tried uh, also to give uh, in these three chapters uh, the, let's say the necessary uh, background information to start reading the rest of the book Regarding the other, uh, the other parts of the book, actually every first chapter of each part, uh, it's actually very basic. So it uh, introduces the, the problem and uh, generally it provides also uh, a first simple example. This is true for recommendation part in which I started with, uh, uh, with the content-based recommendation. It is one of the most, uh, let's say, uh, the most simple approach for providing recommendation. In the fraud detection, again, there is uh, some query-based uh, uh, fraud detection mechanism for identifying uh, uh, fraud rings and, uh, and similar stuff. So again, very, very basic, but at the same time, it, uh, um, it gave me the opportunity to introduce the, the main problems around the fraud detection. And the same is for the, for the last part related to the, to the natural language processing. Uh, in this case, again, the first chapter in this part, it's a, a very um, basic in terms of the knowledge required uh, to uh, to read it through and uh, also to test uh, what's the uh, you know the content or the suggestion in the uh, in, in this new approach this is of course uh, uh, increasing in complexity while you are reading through the uh, through the parts so but um, if you are a newbie the idea is to start from the three chapters the first three chapters and then uh, start reading uh, uh, the first chapter of each part. This could be a good start to have uh, the right, uh, uh, let's say, um, start for for this book. Then, of course, if you find something interesting, you can read uh, um, through the other parts or just jump to other um, uh, part of the book, just uh, using it as a sort of reference later on for for further understanding of more advanced techniques. But again, this is increasing 
in complexity uh, while you are going through each part. And then we start from scratch and uh, one when a, a new part starts. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, Michael mentioned that it took almost three years to get this book out. How many books did you have to read uh, to write this? Well, definitely I uh, bought a lot of books. I would say countless number of books. Uh, I, I didn't read all of them, of course, but um, you know, whenever I found uh, uh, an interesting title or something related to graphs or machine learning, uh, I uh, really had this, uh, um, let's say, uh, pressure to, to buy it and see what's there, even because uh, um, I, I didn't want to write something completely new, but uh, I wanted to structure in a way completely different. So um, buying this book or reading this book books gave me the opportunity to, to see other point of view on one side and on the other, it gave me some, uh, let's say background uh, or solid theory around what uh, uh, I was saying, because I didn't like, uh, you know, to, to state something just because uh, I said it, but uh, I wanted to find uh, uh, some, um, let's say uh, other um, uh, people or other theories that could uh, help me to uh, reinforce what uh, I was uh, writing in the, uh, in the book. So the reason why I had to buy a lot was because I wanted just to give uh, uh, this foundation to the, to the theories that I was, uh, I was presenting. Um, and uh, at the same time, give also people more um, opportunities to go in deep. So the reference at the end of the, each chapter um, is there for this reason, because uh, it's not only what I read, but also what other people can read about um, the, the, the same topic. And uh, if they find something that uh, could be interesting for them, they have opportunities to go through uh, more theories, just reading it through the, uh, the, the reference. So definitely a lot. And not only books, of course, but also a lot of papers I'm, uh, I had uh, to pay for IEEE library and the ACM library to get access to the full of knowledge around machine learning and, uh, and graphs. Right. Um, okay, and what's the story behind the interesting cover of the book? Well, <laughs> well, definitely, uh, you know, in general, um, I like to, um, to give back something to my own country and the closer, the better in this case. So the, um, the cover um, has a, a Tarantella dancer. A tarantella is a, a very typical dance uh, in Southern Italy. And specifically in uh, Apulia, this is uh, where I live, is still a, an active, uh, let's say, practice, uh, I would say. And uh, there are um, a lot of, um, uh, let's say, um, occasions uh, in which uh, these uh, type of song is played. And so I, I wanted to give up, to show, I mean, to talk a bit about uh, my origin and my own country and uh, what's the best opportunity of then just uh, you know representing some of the actual dancer in um, uh, still active in my country so and i asked manning if uh, i can decide my own uh, cover and they said nicely yes of course if i would find the right uh, uh, you know image and so i started uh, searching for it and i found exactly what i wanted and uh, luckily i gave this uh, to, to them and uh, they put on the cover so yeah, but I like it as it is. I would say they did an amazing work in you know cutting things and make it better. Oh, yeah, <laughs> it's very interesting. Um, okay, next question is: What do you think are the most prominent machine learning issues? Uh, maybe problems that machine learning solves that nothing could solve before. Well, that's definitely um, an interesting, uh, an interesting question. Let, let's say that, uh, you know, uh, from my personal perspective, machine learning should uh, uh, help uh, uh, people to process uh, enormous uh, uh, amount of data, but at the same time, give them the uh, opportunity, uh, give people the opportunity to um, take uh, the right uh, information. Because uh, uh, as a human, uh, you know, we cannot, as humans, we cannot uh, process a uh, uh, huge amount of data in the same time that a machine can do, but definitely we have the capability of, uh, um, uh, how to say, um, take the right decisions if we have uh, the right set of information. And imagine that, uh, um, you know, you have uh, to look uh, at uh, uh, all the videos coming from uh, um, an airport security. 
this will be impossible. But uh, machine learning can help you to identify phases that, uh, uh, for example, you will be able to um, then identify better, you know, as a human. So the, the best uh, that we can get uh, from machine learning is uh, this capability of providing the right set of information, specifically in cases in which the amount of data to be, uh, to be processed is not handy. So a human cannot do it, just do it. And uh, um, of course, uh, this interaction between, uh, uh, between humans and um, let's say, and machines, it's the right way to, in which uh, machine learning can help. So um, processing a huge amount of data, uh, processing them faster than what a human can do is definitely, you know, the, the problems that machine learning can solve um, that human cannot. So, and this is true not only for for video imaging about the processing uh, all the tweets, you know, to identify if someone uh, is organizing something or processing the emails or processing the uh, you know textual data of any any source. This would be impossible for human. But what a human can do is then evaluate the results of this analysis and uh, perform the right decision in that sense. So that's the way in which machine learning and humans can work, and that's where. I think we should uh, we should focus, and that's where graphs can help. You know, because uh, this uh, simple data structure can be used uh, by machines and humans at the same time, and that's, in my opinion, one of the biggest advantage in in using the graphs for machine learning because uh, they use the same language for communicating to each other, and that's a great great plus that goes exactly in the direction that I was mentioning of making this interaction more profitable for the tasks that uh, we have to accomplish for security, for our healthcare um, and, and so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, is it possible to use the power of graphs and machine learning to determine the differences between two algorithms? Well, that's, um, that's definitely a, a good point. Actually, uh, it it, it uh, strongly depends on the on the algorithm and the and the data uh, available, because um, uh, you know machine learning can uh, analyze uh, uh, different results can help you in um, uh, you know there is this new trend in which machine learning are uh, machine learning algorithms are used for um, evaluating machine learning or for making them more explainable. There are these new algorithms uh, like uh, Sharp or Line that are now capable of um, explaining the results of the of the algorithms, putting you know in relationship the input with the output, and considering the model as a sort of a of a black box. So the new trend is definitely to have machine learning explaining the results of other machine learning algorithms. In this sense, uh, you know um, graphs can also play uh, an interesting role, uh, specifically when uh, we are talking about uh, graph algorithms. But um, yeah, this will require um, a more detailed discussion because not all the algorithms can be uh, compared, not all the algorithms can be explained uh, in, a, in a simple way. Other require deep analysis or you know, other type of techniques. Okay. Um... I do you think graphs are the solution for all machine learning projects? Well, I would say definitely no. Um, graphs can be one of the solution for some uh, type of problems. Um, as I was mentioning before, you know, my personal idea uh, is that uh, graph powered machine learning is a, a specific area of the machine learning of the broader concept of machine learning. So graphs can help you in, in different stages of a, um, of a machine learning task. Sometimes they can help in uh, improving the quality of the data. Sometimes they can uh, um, help in uh, getting a faster access to the, um, to the machine, uh, let's say to the machine learning models. For example, if you think about recommendations, this is a critical aspect because you cannot provide a recommendation after three minutes, you know, you need to provide a timely recommendation while the user is still on the page. Otherwise, it will be completely useless. Well, in, in these cases, uh, graphs can be helpful. Graphs, of, of course, can be helpful by uh, using their algorithms, so graph specific algorithms uh, to identify, uh, for example, uh, critical people in a social network or to identify or to provide better recommendation in case of cold start problem and so on and so forth. So these are 
further solutions. Uh, uh, these are new uh, arrows in the bow of a data scientist uh, that uh, um, you know has to solve a complex problem. And uh, the more, um, let's say, options I have, uh, uh, the best. There are cases in which algorithms represent uh, such a best solution. In other, they just don't represent uh, uh, such a solution at all, or just a part of the solution. So definitely not for everything. I'm not a fan of saying that you know graphs can solve every uh, human problem. Let's say. Um, and a lighter one. Have you considered doing a podcast? Definitely, mining is on my back, asking constantly for you know working on this uh, podcast. Unfortunately, uh, you know as uh, as always in this case, uh, they require a lot of preparation because of, you cannot just. Uh, start uh, you know go through a podcast without a specific uh, agenda or without a specific uh, um, let's say uh, set of examples for um, uh, you know for showing people concrete stuff so they require time and um, I, I did a couple um, because Manning uh, asked me because of other people invited me to some events but um, uh, definitely it's harder to to be uh, let's say to have the time. For, uh, for doing this kind of stuff. I would love to, but uh, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm planning to have, let's say, few events per, per year. So that's what, we, uh, what I'm planning to do and what we have with, with, uh, with money. And now I'm writing a second book, so the time is getting less and less. Yeah, tell us about that. What's the second book going to be about? Well, actually, uh, I, I can consider it a sort of um, you know, continuation of the previous one. Uh, because the first one um, ended uh, with uh, knowledge graphs. So the new one is uh, mostly speaking about uh, uh, knowledge graphs and uh, all the related uh, algorithms that are becoming prominent in this, uh, uh, in this area. So what we wanted to do in this case, I'm, I'm not the only author because I learned a lesson that if I don't want to make it uh, happening in four years, I need more help. So, um, I mean, the team in, in, in Gafferware is helping me to, to get this book done this time. So the full research uh, team is uh, uh, working on uh, on this um, new challenge, uh, and this time um, uh, we will take the knowledge graph as a topic. So we will go a bit more in deep in uh, um, in this uh, topic because uh, definitely uh, this is generating a lot of interest uh, uh, from our customers, but not only. I mean, uh, in the in the community, uh, it's an odd topic. And we would like also to cover some of the aspects that uh, on purpose we, we left out uh, in the uh, in the previous book because I, I didn't want to make a, like a Bible, you know, of uh, 1,000 1, pages. So I had to decide what to left um, out and um, you know, to, what to leave out. And uh, uh, in this case, for example, we will speak about uh, uh, graph neural networks. That was one of the biggest, uh, um, let's say, topic missing um, in the uh, in the previous book, and uh, that's why you know it will be consistent part of the new book applied uh, to, um, to knowledge graph. Um, that's why, and, and the purpose of the book will be again, very, very practical. That's why the title will be knowledge graph applied. You know, with, uh, uh, with, with this title, we would like to show that uh, it will be rich of uh, uh, technical um, concepts and uh, that can be immediately applied to specific problems, you know, rather than discussing generic uh, topic about knowledge graph. So. That's the purpose. I, and, uh, I mean, we are already working on it. So I think that this more or less will be the, the content of the next one. Again, edited by mining. I mean, we already have a contract with them. So it will be available again with the same editor. All right, looking forward to it. What are your views on the potential of out machine learning for graphs? Of what, sorry? Uh, of the potential of auto machine learning for graphs. Auto machine learning. Yeah. Okay. I have no idea what it is. Okay. We will keep this question for a little bit later. Let's yep. move on in the meantime with um, where do you think AI and machine learning will be in five years? Do you think your book will still be relevant and, or will it need an update? Well, uh, regarding update of the book, I think that um, at some point uh, a second edition will be, will be necessary. 
definitely, you know, we updated uh, it uh, the day before releasing it. So it is really aligned with the latest and greatest, uh, specifically uh, if we speak about the, the libraries available or the, the Neo4j version and uh, what's the, the status out there. Um, but uh, the content of the book itself, I mean, won't require um, some specific update because of course the techniques will remain valid. Of course, there will be some uh, update in terms of uh, the way in which these techniques can be applied uh, in the concrete scenarios because uh, of course the, let's say the libraries, the algorithms will evolve. So some adjustment will be uh, required in the Nivim Manning asked me for, let's say for a second edition in, in some years. Of course, if it will be five or six or seven, I mean, we will decide according to the obsolescence of the content of the book. But uh, with some adjustment, uh, you know, we can easily update it to the, um, let's say, to the um, to the next ten years. Let's say. Okay. Regarding, uh, but you asked me also about the artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, so, as a first part of the book, well, um, the question. Um, well, let me say that. Uh, where we really need to invest our time is to um, migrate from a concept of, our, of AI from, you know, intended as a artificial intelligence to more a sort of augmented intelligence in which, uh, you know, we can see, as I was mentioning before, machines and uh, human working together to accomplish even more complex, uh, more complex tasks. So uh, in this sense, uh, I really see a lot of value in investing, you know, our effort in books, in uh, dissemination, and uh, in our work to to make this happening uh, faster and, and and better. So I, I really see that uh, as practitioners, we should uh, uh, more and more work on uh, um, putting the human in the loop of these uh, uh, machine learning tasks, so that we can have definitely better results. Because of course, humans can do things that the machines cannot. So uh, definitely, you know, our capability of abstracting is far better than what a machine can do uh, because we can create uh, rather than uh, uh, just analyze data and uh, abstract uh, something, you know? So definitely this uh, combination of the power of machines to process a huge amount of data and our abstracting capabilities uh, will be the, the power of the next AI intended as augmented intelligence. For the next years. Okay. And what would you say are the biggest challenges facing the fast adoption of graph-powered machine learning across the globe? Well, definitely, uh, what I see day by day, um, you know, working with our customers, it, the the problem is related to the dimension of the data, um, the, because uh, you know, in the last years we. Um, we noticed how much people were, companies specifically, were able to collect data from wherever. And uh, we are getting out uh, of a phase, I mean, uh, in which uh, um, we, we have companies collecting in this uh, data lake uh, a huge amount of data, a huge amount of information. So this availability of the data, um, you know, in, in this second stage in which we are applying more advanced techniques based on graph, like knowledge graphs, for example, you know, it's showing how um, scalability is uh, one of the um, biggest concern because uh, graphs require connectivity. So in theory, in an ideal scenario, you should have a single graph containing uh, all the knowledge that you have, all the data that you collected over the years. But of course, this is translated in a, in a unmanageable graph, in a manageable source of data or source of knowledge that uh, will require specific uh, um, hardware, for example, for processing it. This, uh, that will require specific algorithms for processing it and software, of course. So the, the combination of all this uh, will represent the next big challenge for the, uh, for the future because all of our customers you know, have huge amount of data and ideally they would like to process all to get uh, complex answers. In some cases, of course, this is not the right approach because of course, what we suggest is to just start from the goal and then go back and decide what what is the or what are the, the most relevant data sources um, to start to working on you know to start getting the data in the knowledge graph but uh, even in this case 
uh, the, the amount of data represent um, one of the biggest uh, the biggest challenge because more and more we are getting uh, the, um, used to machine learning uh, uh, the more we would like to get um, answer faster you know and of course this requires uh, huge uh, capability of processing data actually <clears throat> And how was your writing process? What were the main problems and challenges or motivations that you had? Well, <laughs> well definitely these four years, um, um, it, it took uh, different moments uh, of my life and uh, you know, my career because, of course, uh, uh, the pandemic disease uh, happened a lot because uh, it uh, forced me to be uh, at home for a long time actually uh, without traveling all around the globe because before you know it it uh, the, the best moment for me to write was when i was on a plane for hours you know traveling from europe to us for example or from europe to uh, the emirates so it was a perfect moment for me to focus on something completely disconnected and um, uh, and focus on the book so this was uh, one of the of the pattern but actually what i learned uh, um, across this uh, uh, process was that uh, I needed to, to spend a solid time um, uh, working on the, um, let's say, on the book for at least for one hour. So at the beginning, I was working uh, almost overnight when my kids and my wife were sleeping, but we, this didn't work that well. So I can draw pictures and uh, do some examples, but uh, not actively writing. So I changed completely my habits and started uh, working in the early morning when, again, nobody was still working and nobody was around. Um, and it was the best way for me to, to focus at least for one solid hour per day, um, you know, regardless if it is a Saturday or Sunday or a weekday. And um, this helped me uh, a lot, uh, apart from the, the travels. But uh, unfortunately, for half of the writing, I was not able to travel because of the COVID. So. Right. So how long do you think it will take to write you the second book, given that um, you have some help now. No, yeah, I definitely. Know. I learned also this lesson. You know, I mean, because uh, first of all, it's it's useful to have other co-authors to speak about the book. You know, in a, in a way in which you you can discuss and have a different opinions and have other people's um, also experience. Because uh, uh, luckily at Gapware we have a, a a lot of customers that we served in, in these years for which we are actively working. But since we grew a lot. We, we moved from a moment in which uh, just a few of us were, were doing a consultancy. And so we were directly exposed to the, to the problems in a moment in which we have an entire team you know, providing a consultancy. Um, so we cannot cover the full of knowledge uh, in, in, few, in a single person as it was before. Uh, and, and now, of course, I ask the, these people that are also providing a consultancy, that are also studying by themselves the problem from different perspectives to join uh, this effort and this definitely will be um, translated directly in a higher quality of the book. Definitely, it should be fingers crossed faster um, because we are really planning to um, to release uh, a MIP uh, by the beginning of the next year. So, like January or February, where we should already have this uh, mining early access program um, book available, so that people can start reading at least the first three chapters or four. We will see. But uh, the plan is really to, to work faster and release something by the end of the next year, beginning of the uh, 2023, because we, we would like to keep the momentum around the knowledge graph and uh, condense all the work. I mean, see, I mean, it's a simple computation is I was able to write it in three years, three people. I mean, we should be able to write it in one year. I mean, that's the, the raw computation. It's also true that uh, nine women will never get a baby in one month but you know this is not the case hopefully okay um and what is your personal favorite uh machine learning project or application interesting project? question well actually um definitely i i could say that uh, my career in this combination between the graphs and machine learning started with a recommendation so um, I wrote the first uh, library on top of Neo4j that provided a recommendation. And still, I see so many um, cases uh, that are even not directly related to recommendation in which I can use exactly the same uh, 
uh, approaches that I was uh, using for recommendation. If you think about similarity, for example, this is used in tons of different use cases, uh, not only recommendation, but also clustering and, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. So I, I could definitely say uh, that the recommendation is uh, my favorite one because I started with it. It's still super valid and useful in uh, tons of different scenarios. And um, it's one of the most challenging for which uh, a lot of people are still struggling to get uh, the right set of recommendation that will take into account uh, different type of uh, um, things, not only technical, but also business-wise, because the recommendation is uh, in most of the cases a business problem because they have to sell more, to cross-sell, or uh, to just provide a better recommendation because this will improve the confidence in the in a platform, for example. So definitely one of the most challenging tasks that uh, I love the most. Okay. And um, how many how many books did you sell already? Is it anything like what you expected, or have definitely you unexpected? Uh, even because I didn't have any number in my mind uh, because I didn't know. I just didn't know. Um, then uh, when we started, uh, you know, with the MIP program, uh, Manning was uh, happily surprised about the amount of book that uh, amount of books that uh, they were able to sell. And now we are around uh, three thousand and five hundred. It is a kind of interesting number. You know, my personal goal is to reach five thousand. I mean, I cannot do much more than just speaking to people, but you know, that's my. I mean, it will be satisfying number. You know, and uh, of course, these numbers are not taking into account, uh, for example, the except uh, that uh, Neo4j is releasing, and uh, and other uh, you know events or other components that uh, or papers that we are releasing as a part of the uh, of the book because uh, Manning and Graphover you know are also publishing uh, some some parts of the book that are also read by uh, other people so definitely it's spreading the voice that was one of the main purpose of the of the book so I can consider this a sort of success you know in terms of reachability and uh, is uh, everything that you've written based on your experience or have you did you have to talk to other people and their experience for example or well definitely not all is uh, based on direct experience uh, even though i would say a great i mean 80 percent is based on my experience um for the rest but even for what was my personal experience i um i wanted to to search um for more examples you know based on other people's experience so i would say that i didn't literally speak with other people but i used uh, other people production uh, not only books but also blog posts uh, but also um uh, you know um readings from from papers and uh, and similar stuff so i used uh, other people's experience to to get uh, you know, learning uh, other tasks, for example, that I, I was not involved with directly, or to enforce my understanding of some of the things that uh, uh, that I have done. I have a concrete example in the in the chapter about um, uh, session based uh, recommendation. You know, I I used to do it before, uh, but I didn't call it a session based recommendation. So I learned about it in a conference about recommendation. So there were people speaking about session-based recommendation and when they were uh, discussing about it and they were describing it, I said, oh, wow, this is what I did. You know, So this gave me also the opportunity to use the right set of terms so that people were searching for that specific stuff that they didn't know was a session-based recommendation and someone else coined this term in the meantime and uh, I was able to, to use it uh, in a proper way. This is a, a perfect example of you know, something that you learn from practicing and uh, and then you discover that uh, this is a, a well-known practice. And then uh, I find the, um, this term very interesting and uh, very appropriate for, for what I was describing. And so I said, okay, why not? Let's call it a session-based recommendation. That was actually much better than mine. That I even cannot remember how we called it before. Okay. Our next question is: um, the book has a strong focus on commercial applications. Could you speak about the relevance of graph-powered machine learning to networks found, for example, in scientific research applications? 
Well, definitely, I would say that these uh, will be one of the oldest topic of the next book, because uh, I definitely agree that uh, this is becoming a prominent, specifically when applied to knowledge graphs. And um, there will be uh, a lot of examples in the, uh, in the next, um, in next book. The reason why, um, you know, uh, this wasn't uh, discussed in the previous one is because uh, this type of literature analysis, I would say, or scientific research and so on and so forth, is, uh, requires a lot of uh, natural language processing that on purpose was not the, uh, the, the key topic of the, uh, of the graph powered machine learning book, but it will be one of the key elements of the new one in which uh, we will discuss how to build the knowledge graphs out of textual data in a proper way, even considering, for example, naming entity disambiguation, that was again another topic that was untouched in the uh, in the previous uh, in the previous book. Unfortunately, I had to take some decision and, and leave something out on purpose because otherwise it will be uh, a very long one. So we agreed with Manning to keep something out and to schedule a second book on this topic. It will be in the second book and actually in the early uh, chapters. So maybe that uh, in six months from now, it will be already published something around the topic. Okay, sounds great. Um, thanks, we're nearing to the end. So um, there are a couple more questions in the Q&A. If you wanna have a quick look through, I'll just talk for a little bit. <laughs> um, so thank you everyone for joining us here. Uh, we are recording this session, so you will receive it by email later. And we will announce the winners of the free books uh, in the upcoming days. So then we'll contact you and you can send us your addresses and I'll send the books over. So good luck to you all. <laughs> and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Okay, thank you, bye.